Sanders has the best, most progressive policy platform in the race. And this isn't just a subjective claim from his national spokesperson, it's been corroborated by third parties over and over again. For example, the Sunrise Movement recently gave Bernie the top score among all 2020 candidates for his Green New Deal policy. In The Nation, sociologist Nikhil Goyal described Bernie's K-12 plan as the most progressive and equitable public education agenda of any presidential candidate in the modern history of the United States. Terrell Starr, at The Root, wrote that Bernie's criminal justice plan is, quote, just as radical as his economic policies, lauding in particular his policy to limit qualified immunity for police officers. No other candidate has a plan to end at-will employment, an employment standard which basically lets your boss fire you for any reason at all, for any time. And only Bernie has a plan to save journalism from corporate corruption. This, and I cannot stress this enough, is enormously important and reason alone to support Senator Sanders. But it happens not to be the core reason why I support Bernie. The reason I support Bernie lies beyond any one policy. It has more to do with his worldview, a worldview which says preserving human dignity is the ultimate test, not polls. A perspective that understands the intrinsic value of human life. A worldview which says none of us are free, until all of us are free. The policies are good in the first place because they stem from humanistic principles. That's how you get an environmental policy that sees meeting decarbonization goals as non-negotiable, not merely an option. A policy which ensures a just transition for those currently working in the carbon energy sector to good paying jobs in clean energy or elsewhere. This is how you get a health insurance policy that understands that at no point should financial considerations affect whether or not you seek treatment, something that can only happen if you embrace free at point of service, Medicare for all. And this is how you get the confidence of knowing that when something unexpected comes up, whether it's the Iraq war, the AIDS crisis, or the question of whether incarcerated Americans should have the right to vote, Bernie Sanders is going to be on the right side of history. I think of this mindset as putting people first, putting society first, and it presents a stark contrast with the way most politicians have operated historically. You see, usually capital or money comes first. We're all used to politicians who embrace a system that says, if you become unemployed, it's tough luck if you don't have healthcare or a home or tuition for school. They say markets should decide how much pollution or toxic chemicals should be released into our environment, and that we should trust corporate CEOs who admit that their driving doctrine is to increase shareholder value with our health, our planet, and our future. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. The average American understands completely how money influences outcomes. You know that interest groups like pharmaceutical companies and banks don't support political campaigns out of the goodness of their hearts, but to ensure a candidate's agenda is friendly to their bottom line. <laughs> Heck, billionaire Michael Bloomberg has entered the presidential race with an initial $57 million ad investment because spending $57 million is cheaper than losing half of his $50 billion fortune. And sickeningly, it's working. Bloomberg has bought his way right to the middle of the pack. I don't think it's radical to say that the President of the United States should be driven by a different principle than the one that drives CEOs like Bloomberg. Call me crazy, but I think the first priority of politicians shouldn't be maximizing shareholder value, but traditional little notions like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our conceptions of freedom must include freedom from want, or they mean nothing at all. It's not enough to be free to consume, to smoke Virginia Slims and eat sugary cereal and buy guns. We also need the choice to leave abusive employers without risking losing our insurance. We need the freedom to choose between trade school and college without a lack of financial resources making that choice for us. And we need the freedom to go to work and school and to dance without fearing that we're going to die from gun violence. Whether you call Bernie's worldview democratic socialism, 
and the alternative capitalism, or whether you reject all those labels in favor of a gut feeling, I think it's important to realize the stakes are higher than any one agenda item. Bernie has already changed the way Americans see the world, making a $15 minimum wage, Medicare for all, and a wealth tax overwhelmingly popular policies that now form the baseline of the Democratic Party agenda. We shouldn't, we can't stop now. This week, I spoke to my good friend and former colleague, Nathan J. Robinson, co-founder of Current Affairs Magazine, about his new book, Why You Should Be a Socialist. Now, if you're skeptical about that title, it's okay. In fact, he wrote the book just for you. I wanted to talk to him for this episode, not because I want to evangelize about socialism per se, but because he might be the single best writer I've ever read when it comes to capturing why kindness and decency must be a central starting point for anyone's politics and why I'm so glad it's at the heart of our revolution. I am so excited to be joined by my friend, author, and co-founder of Current Affairs Magazine, Nathan J. Robinson. Nice to be back with you after so long. After so long. I mean, I think some people, not a lot of people, but some people who listen to the podcast do know me from Current Affairs. And they're always asking me when I'm going to go back and write for them. I would also ask you that question. <laughs> I know. When, I, when are you going to wrap up all this <laughs> nonsense and you come got, back to our <laughs> tiny lefty magazine in New Orleans? You, you got to ask Bernie. You got to ask Bernie. So I will credit you with being the one that has made me Brianna Joy Gray. Because before I was just going, for my first article I ever published was actually under a pseudonym. And then the first public article I ever published under my own name was with Current Affairs, and you're the one that stuck the joy in there. I'm, I'm the joy, you, I put the joy you in my life. the joy in Brianna Joy Gray. And I think it's a little bit like, I think, I, and Nathan J. Robinson, I think yeah. people with, it's like the J middle you name without have, simpatico. Yeah, but you have, like, if you have joy in your name, <laughs> You've got to use it because it just um, makes people happy to meet you. Well, that's that's my mom's idea, and I, she'll be very gratified to hear that you um, have decision. carried out her plan to fruition. But but tell me a little bit, Nathan, for those who don't know about Current Affairs yeah. and what the magazine is like, I think it's a good segue into talking about your book because sure. obviously your ideology, your worldview is expressed in the, in the pages of this magazine as well. Yes. So we, Current Affairs is a, as I said, a little lefty print magazine. We were founded in 2015 through a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, and we've kind of, I mean, we're still small, but we've kind of taken off um, a bit. And uh, we do political analysis and commentary, but the magazine also has, like, I, I, I'm trying to make political writing not feel like eating your vegetables. <laughs> I'm trying to have it not be like something that you put yourself through because you feel obligated to, but have the writing itself be really enjoyable. So the magazine has puzzles and cutouts and games and it's got a kind of mad magazine feel to it. And, you know, the editors that we have amassed at Current Affairs, and you were an editor for with us for some time, are people who are, you know, who have very, very strong political commitments, but who are also fun and who have, you know, a, a real sense of bringing, you know, like life should have some pleasure in it. And right. our magazine has some pleasure in it. I hope this book also continues. So when I was thinking about writing the book, I was thinking, well, how do I write something about socialism that is readable to non-socialists and that doesn't feel boring? And I think that you've genuinely succeeded. I mean, I was I was breezing through this on the train recently, um, and I was struck not just by what a fun and easy read it was, um, but by how much... I think the reason why it's so digestible is that it's not just this kind of like didactic recounting of the history of socialism or political arguments about why socialism. There's some of that in here as well, but it's also a book that is very much woven in with your morals and values yeah. and how you see the world and the world as it as it should be. Can you can you talk a little bit about why this book yeah. uh, and what and what it what the case you make in it is? So, well, so I mean, first the the a lot of that comes from the audience that I was imagining for this book, right? Which is my working title was Socialism for People Who Are Extremely Skeptical of It, mm. and I wanted to think about. I read a lot of right wing books, and one of the things I do a lot at Current Affairs is write long takedown pieces or just mostly dissections of conservative yeah, God, arguments. God bless you for and, that work. And so I have a, a pretty strong understanding of how the right thinks and what yeah. the right wing worldview is. And so I wanted to think, well, how would I persuade someone 
who really bought into what I think are the myths about socialism. And so I don't actually think that people who have a very fixed uh, conservative worldview are going to read my book and become socialists. I, I think that's, that's wishful thinking on my part. But what I did want to do is make sure that people who are skeptical, as I say, of socialism, come away with it at the very minimum with respect for socialists and feeling as if what we are talking about when we use that word and the underlying ideas that we're referring to are not crazy and that a lot of us are very smart and we think about um, the, the, the criticisms that are made of socialism and we, and we deal with them and there is a real strong sense that socialists are just naive, they just believe in f random free things, they just have a child's view of the world and actually sometimes we do have a child's <laughs> view of the world because we think morality is often very simple. Mm. Um, but uh, I, I want them to get to, to sort of feel like socialism is a, is a respectable position to come from. So, so for the skeptics, yeah. why do you think that people are skeptical? Um, why should they not be skeptical? And do you think there's any, any legitimacy to folks who do have a kind of aversion, a knee-jerk response when they hear the S word? Well, I mean, let's first talk about what socialism has historically been, which is it, I, the way I kind of define it in this book is as a political tradition that captures a lot of different um, ways of thinking, right? There are arguments between socialists, very strong arguments between those socialists who believe in a, a strong centralized state and those socialists who are anarchists and don't believe in the state at all. But they cohere around the idea of um, that ordinary working people should be more empowered. All socialists detest the idea of having a ruling class of extremely wealthy people and a laboring class of people who essentially have no freedom at work and who, you know, who subsist, basically. That has been the, the core socialist complaint about the world. And I think it is, it is obviously very understandable that when people hear the word socialism, they react in the way that you know, we've all been taught to react, which is to think about the, the most famous examples of a socialist society, you know, which is the Soviet Union or North Korea, right? Um, but so it's kind of understandable, but what you have to understand is socialism is a very rich political tradition. Mm -hmm. There were socialists all the way along who were criticizing centralizing tendencies who were very, very pro-libertarian -liber uh, sort of approach to, um, to freedom, which is we don't want the state to crack down on free speech or we don't, we don't, we're prison abolitionists, so we don't want gulags. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's a very, and Democrat, people who call themselves democratic socialists have always been very, very strong on you know, fighting attempts by the state to repress dissidents, uh, whoever they are. Right, so, like Bernie Sanders, that, that, that yeah. tradition that he leans on and uh, something that's difficult for this campaign because we always say democratic socialists and the media per prefers to say socialists. Not that it is an, an, an epithet, but it's used that way, yeah. right? And so there's this constant dance of having to stick the democratic back in there because it does reassure people that what yeah. we're talking about, to your point about libertarian socialism, is not state control, but putting control back in the power in the hands of the people. Ultimately, it shouldn't have to have the word democratic in front of it because if we take socialism to be a principle of worker ownership or common ownership or the commons, um, then, you know, an undemocratic system isn't socialism. If you ask the question, you know, is North Korea a socialist country? Well, do working people, are they empowered? Do they, do they feel like they have control over their lives and their working conditions? Not really, so not particularly socialist. I mean, North Korea also calls itself the, the, the Democratic People's Republic of, but they're not democratic, they're not a republic. Right. So I think we should think about socialism the same way. A country that calls itself socialist is not socialist because it calls itself that. And you know, the fact that people have rallied under banners of things that they don't actually carry out doesn't discredit the underlying ideas. It just means that we have to take the ideas seriously and we have to be very, very critical. And we have to say, no, you're not actually upholding the principle for which we stand.
So one thing that kind of makes me crazy about this debate about socialism, democratic socialism, is that we're constantly asked the question, what is socialism? How do we define it? But very rarely is anybody asked to define capitalism and defend some of the vulnerabilities of the system that we currently live under. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what you do in this book is to unpack some of these basic um, premises, These a lot of them are economic in nature, that are the foundation of the system that we live in. Can you talk a little bit about why you um, doubt capitalism as a preferred system and what kind of the worst kind of ills are that we're living with today as a consequence of capitalism? So people, when people talk about capitalism, they often try and use it, especially defenders, to mean just markets, mm -hmm. exchange. And so when they criticize socialism, they usually say, well, here's why you, a society needs money and you know why ex free exchange is good. But there are more aspects that define capitalism. There's been exchange preceded capitalism. And when socialists talk about capitalism, what we're really talking about is that, that class division between having a small owning class and a very, very large working class. And what we're trying to fix is that kind of power arrangement. And that really has very little to do with markets. There is a philosophy called market socialism, which some people think is contradictory. There are socialists who think it, it's, it's contradictory. Um, but what market socialists advocate is common ownership of things and then a market, but you know, it would be, so like, for example, you know, we'd all collectively own Amazon, but we'd still buy things through Amazon, right? But Amazon shares would be owned, you know, it's a nationalized company, they're all owned by everyone in the country equally, right? right? But that doesn't actually change the use of the of the platform, it just change, changes the ownership of the institution and who receives the benefits. So that's the that's the kind of thing that market socialists advocate. And I think when we when we try to zero in on the, the class differences and the questions of power that socialists are concerned with, that becomes much more difficult for defenders of capitalism to stick up for. I mean, you know, this is why socialists zero in on billionaires, because billionaires are incredibly, incredibly powerful people um, who have just, you know, money is power. So concentrated right. money is concentrated power, which means it's undemocratic. It's undemocratic yeah. in the way that, like, having one person have a billion votes would be undemocratic. I think that's an incredibly powerful point. There's a quote in this book, I don't remember by who, that says, you can have large concentrations of money uh, among very few people, or you can have democracy, but you cannot have both. Yeah. Um, and uh, there was an also a, an article along those lines written recently, and I think the New York Times, where the author was arguing that it's not just about um, redistribution, uh, kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, wanting to have a more progressive tax plan, the kinds of plans that Bernie Sanders has put, put forward. It's also about preserving democracy, because mm -hmm. originally, the, even the even the founding fathers understood that there should be a limit to the life of a corporation. That sure, there is some utility in, in generating large amounts of money so that you can build bridges or highways or what have you. But at the end of the day, if you have that much money in the hands of so few people, that necessarily it's going to compromise the ability of every person's vote and every person's voice to be equally weighted. A lot of people who sort of defend capitalism say, well, why are you so concerned with people at the top? Why don't you just say, you know, we're going to tax Bill Gates enough to provide a, a social safety net, and then it's fine. Why should why you should bring the bottom up? You shouldn't tear mm. the top down. But having co concentrated wealth at the top again, money is power. So money is speech. If you have a lot of money, you can get your message out. You know, through you can buy a newspaper. I mean, this is what happens in in Britain. In Britain, it's even worse because very very rich people own the papers and they're basically just. Oh, do we not also have that? Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, but so like having someone like Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates means they have the power to shape the country in, to fit their vision. I mean, Bezos has this vision for like moon colonies. Mm. He can have a private space program that like builds, rebuilds space in the image of his dreams. Bill Gates can take the American education system and he could say like, these are the reforms that I want to the American education system. And there's no democracy because money isn't democratic. We don't get to vote on how money is spent. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, when you open this book up, I want to I start back mm -hmm. in, the, in the beginning because 
There are a lot of people who say, okay, fine, there are a lot of things abstractly, ethically that I agree with. I agree that um, you know, income inequality, wealth inequality has gotten to extremes. I can see that there's a reality of um, life expectancy going down mm -hmm. um, uh, among white Americans at least, suicide rates going up, diseases of despair increasing, mm -hmm. you know, I, and this is a problem. Yeah. But why do we have to completely upend our system? Can't we just tweak capitalism? Why do you have to use this word that is potentially so off-putting to so many people? What's your response to that? So I, I think one of the, the mistakes people make is to think of capitalism and socialism as systems where like we have capitalism and and we can decide whether like Finland has capitalism. Socialism is best thought of as a spectrum of more capitalistic policies and more socialistic policies. And what we're saying is we should continuously move in the direction of more and more socialistic policies. So more and more common ownership, more and more cooperatives, a stronger labor movement, um, the, the more things that we do possess in common instead of things that just serve a small number of private interests. And so, and if you think of it that way, then obviously the Nordic countries are far more socialistic than the United States. And, you know, when you say oh, upend the entire system, well, again, you're moving along a spectrum. You're not upending the entire system. These things are done through experimentation. You try some policies, some of them don't work. But the point is that the policies that you introduce and the direction that you move in is a socialistic direction. It's an egalitarian direction that is concerned with having a society in which people don't feel powerless, in which people don't feel like their lives are controlled. So I think that's a, that's an interesting point that there are socialistic aspects of our current system mm -hmm. that just aren't perceived that way. Oh yeah. And if it helps people to um, embrace this idea better, it, then you know it's helpful to point out that okay, we are talking about the fire department. Yes. Right. So over lunch just now we were talking about how um, there is this controversy over whether or not we should have free uh, public colleges and university in this country. Mm -hmm. And many on the left will draw the comparison with, you know, well, we have free elementary and free middle school and free high school. Yeah. We, uh, many, the majority of jobs now require a college education. It only makes sense that we should have free public college as yes. well. But there's another comparison that you um, yeah. also like to draw. What is that? Well, okay, let's take, let's just take Medicare for all, for example, right? Medicare for all, which the purpose is to have people not have to pay for their health care. It's paid for because it's paid for in taxes, uh, but it's free at the point of use, right? Which is you don't have, when you go to the doctor, you don't get a bill. Um, that is currently the way the fire department operates. When you call them to come and extinguish your house, you don't get a bill. And we think, and, and it's a government service. It's it's owned and operated by the state. It's funny that Ronald Reagan said that the scariest words in the English language were, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, because when your house is on fire, those are exactly the words you want to hear right. because you need the government to come and help you. Now imagine if history had gone a little differently and it was the fire department that today operated the way that medicine operates and ambulances, there was an ambulance department and they came, they picked you up, they took you to the hospital and you didn't get a bill, right? If the fire department operated, if, if firefighting operated the way, it would be crazy, right? Because it would mean that, first off, you had plenty of people who didn't, who just had to pay giant bills to private yeah. companies to come and extinguish their house. Then there'd be this system of insurance, of private insurance, so that people paid like a monthly firefighting premium. Yeah. And then there was a deductible if your house burned down, where you still had to pay $5,000, but you didn't have to pay $25,000. Do you pay more if your house is older or is living closer to other wooden houses or if it's bigger and requires more resources and like a pre-existing condition. Yeah. Oh, has your house burned down before, in which case it'd be hard to get insurance or it'd be higher. And, and then, of course, Obamacare would be like, well, we're going to provide subsidies for people's private fire insurance for their private fire companies. And it, it's just kind of a crazy system to imagine. And you can also see how it, it would have the incentive effect of causing people not to want to call the fire department, the way that today people put off essential medical care because they know they can't afford it. They and take Ubers to the hospital when they have a heart People don't want to call an ambulance. Yeah. People are begging not to be put in an ambulance. Yeah. I mean, I begged once not to be put in an ambulance because yeah. I knew it would cost $1,000. They put me in an ambulance anyway. They said, you need an ambulance. You can't take a taxi. And so that that is an incentive that you don't want to have. You don't want to have people thinking about money in regard to the house burning down 
or in regard to their basic healthcare. And the point of single payer healthcare, which is not even as radical as in socialized medicine, which they have in Britain, um, which is like a fire department. Um, but the point of it is to is to really take away having to think about money. And we want more things where you can focus on the thing that that's about. And free college is the same. We want people to, to judge whether they should go to college, not based on whether they can afford it, whether they're gonna be in 10 years of debt uh, for going to college, based on whether they want to go to college, whether it's useful for them, and whether they, what they're interested in learning. So, so in the beginning of the book, you talk about how millennials in particular are are very open to this concept, in part because we have been dealing with some of the the, the, the worst effects of late stage capitalism, some of which I went through. And to us, what you're describing is a kind of freedom. Mm -hmm. Freedom from feeling like your health care is tied to your employer. Freedom to go and get a new job or to leave a job where you're being abused because you don't have to worry about whether or not you can pay for health care. Um, you know, freedom to choose what you want to do, whether it's trade school, whether it's go to college, but not to have to make that decision based on how well that your parents are. And yet, uh, as you point to in the book, one of the many arguments that is often levied against the idea of socialism is that it, it limits freedom. Yeah. You know, why? Can you talk a little bit about that? What is what is the counter argument that you get, and why is it so um, disingenuous? Well, you know, usually the counter argument is just the word Venezuela. So, you, know, <laughs> you know, oh well, this authoritarian society called itself socialism. Right. Uh, I mean, the what libertarians say is well, okay. Every time you empower the state, you necessarily crush someone's freedom. They, you know, taxation is is theft, and people should be free to do what they want with their with their property, uh, instead of it having to it being taken away from them by force and used to subsidize someone else's healthcare. Um, that's a conception of freedom, but what we point out is that in practice what it ends up meaning is that if you can't sell your labor, if you don't have value on the market, if you're you know, a disabled person, a senior, you know, or if you just don't, you know, there are no jobs, you're gonna starve to death. Um, and if you don't get a job, uh, because if you don't get a job, you starve, you have to accept whatever conditions your employer attaches to your work. So if your employer says, um, as a condition of your job, you have to hand over your all your social media passwords, right. and we get to look through all of your chat history. As a condition of this, uh, you're not allowed to work in a, a, another uh, in this industry in another job for five years. Uh, you're not allowed. Every grievance you have will go to arbitration. They could even, you know, fit in the libertarian world, they could even write in like you're going to be subject to sexual harassment, and you have to, you know, you have to put up with it because. That's contractual freedom. You signed up right, for I'm it. Pretty so. sure those in those Fox News contracts. Yeah, <laughs> that, well, you know, there is kind of that conception, which yeah. is like, if you take a job, your choice is to put up with it or leave because you made the choice. You had freedom. Yeah. And what we point out on the left is, we care way less about the freedom of people who already have tons of money to bully and exploit people than the freedom of other people to live well and not be subject to harassment and abuse and not have to think of money when they go to the doctor. Yeah, this is part of why I'm such an evangelist for our Workplace Democracy Act, which, you know, mm. when you're flipping through our policies, maybe the Workplace Democracy Act isn't the one that jumps out at you. But being the only campaign that wants to end at-will employment, you know, I, I constantly am trying to make the point that this is a social justice issue, this is a racial justice issue, this is a gender equality issue, because you, if you don't have the freedom to leave those exploitative environments, you're much more likely to be um, part of them and to have, uh, and it's important also to have employers who aren't able to dismiss you for those kind of protected reasons um, without having to justify why, right? Um, so, uh, you know, it, there is this um, necessarily wedded moral argument that you're making, but you're making it in tandem with a real um, vigorous scrutiny of these underlying economic presumptions. So mm -hmm. one of them that you talk about is, you know, this idea that, you know, will, like willingness to pay equals ability to mm -hmm. pay. And, you know, the coerciveness that is inherent in having a system where you're bounded in basically by scarcity, yeah. right? And so to, to put it, you know, in, in simple terms, it feels to me like you're coming into this book and your ideolo ideology more broadly saying, I have a very low tolerance, a complete intolerance even, for 
um, kind of these kind of systemic inequities that a lot of people just kind of assume are a part of the world. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. There's always going to be yeah. some poor people. That's what you hear capitalists say all the yeah. time. People who have a lot of money have a lot of money because they just worked harder. Yeah. Jeff Bezos worked. I don't can't even do the math of how many yeah. billions of times harder yeah. than me and you yeah. that he is, is alleged He's to an have. How do you come to that ideology? Like, what what does it take to shake people from um, the presumptions that we've all been encoded <laughs> with over the last thirty odd years, forty well, fifty, however many years of our lives? Well, I mean, to me, all it takes is actually looking at the world, right? Because yeah. the free market story is a kind of like almost science fiction, almost like speculative fiction. It's like a description of a, how a world would work, yeah. like how this beautiful lemonade stand economy where, you know, Milton Friedman has this quote where he says, well, you know, employment contracts aren't coercive because if someone, people don't want to enter the marketplace, a household could just produce for itself. And you're like, well, that in a world of farmers and artisans, Maybe, right. but you can't produce for yourself. See, That's not. Does, does my lease allow for a rooftop garden? <laughs> you, you, you can't. You can't do it. It's not actually an option. So yeah. it is actually coercive. You have to. You have to get employed in yeah. the in the real world that that we're actually in. Um, if you you know, it's very easy for like for example, someone like Ben Shapiro to make the argument. Um, it, well, he he t cites the Brookings Institute success sequence, which is um, if you graduate high school, get married, and have a full time job, you won't be in poverty which is kind of true, but it ignores the fact that most of the people in poverty are, you know, people are old people, students, people who can't work. Children. <laughs> Children. You're like, you're going to tell a child, well, why didn't you just graduate high school and get married? You go, Be because... It's a child, right? It's not the real world. You're not actually looking at the situation. Or their caregivers, people who have to take care of other people in their family so they're poor, right? This is the reality uh, of, of the world. And so you need to just look around you and you have to say, does it work? Does this freedom, this freedom to choose, what does it look like at work? And the answer is, it looks like surveillance, but it looks like a surveillance state by your by your boss. I mean, Elizabeth Anderson has this uh, great book, Private Government, where she talks about the workplace as a private government mm. and how if we evaluated companies by the same principles that we do political philosophy in regard to the company, it would be a dictatorship. And if you told people, if you gave people the free market story about an actual dictatorship, you said, well, you can leave. It wouldn't right. make it not a dictatorship. You know, you'd say, no, I'm not going to leave. I need to reform this. We need to have a fair structure. And so you need to start thinking about workplaces the same way. So I want to I want to ask you about um, Bernie a little bit. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about Bernie. Because, you know, throughout this book and, you know, in current affairs, I mean, one of the things that really helped to put current affairs in the map was this article that you did in 2016. <laughs> that if people had just listened to, <laughs> right. a lot, a lot of mess would have been avoided. Right. So in 2016, you wrote this article about how if Bernie Sanders isn't the nominee, Donald Trump is going to be president. And it wasn't this, <laughs> it wasn't this just like what happened? What based happened on that? poll numbers, this kind of like empty, right. vapid um, piece. It was... Uh, an accounting of what the vulnerabilities of the different players in 2016 were yeah. lined up against a Trump's vulnerabilities and his strengths. Yeah. And, a, and, and, an, and a substantive analysis that said, hey, a, a corporatist candidate, a status quo candidate is going to have trouble pointing to the flaws in Donald Trump yeah. when they have been running basically in the same circles for their entire life. They're taking money from similar places. They have similar um, issues with their personal lives yeah. that are very different in scope and magnitude, but are easily manipulated by someone who is as dexterous with yeah. the truth yeah. <laughs> or yeah, 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 lies yeah. as Donald Trump. So going into this next <laughs> round where we have similar kind of like teams that have yeah. formed in terms of a, a more progressive mm -hmm. wing um, of candidates and a more moderate wing of candidate, I'm curious why, um, like how, how you're seeing this play out in, in 2020. Well, first, um, in 2016, when I was analyzing, you know, I was look. I had this moment where I looked at Hillary and I looked at Bernie, and I went, "Oh my God, the Democrats are about to nominate someone who's going to lose. Mm. They're going to. She's she's going to lose. I mean, it was really just you, Michael Moore, just a Michael small Moore was handful very good of too, people, right? And Michael really got the reasons why why she lost. I mean, he's like Midwest. If you're going to lose the Midwest, it's going to be a disaster because no one likes her there. 
oh, well, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, as I looked at that, I thought, well, hang on a minute. Let's imagine Hillary on the debate stage with Donald Trump, and he'll talk about, you know, how Bill harassed a bunch of people. You know, he'll talk about the Iraq war. He'll run to Hillary's left on things. But let's imagine Bernie on the debate stage with Trump. And I still want that to happen. You know, Trump agreed with the, to a debate with Bernie and then backed out, didn't he, mm. at, at one point? Did he? I, I, I think there was a moment where, like, he the, maybe he maybe said he... This isn't just the James Adomian uh, I, sketch that we're thinking of. No, I, I, you know, I, I think that Bernie would just do phenomenally against Donald Trump because Donald Trump thrives on scandal, personal things, things he can pick at that are just, he wants to distract you. He wants someone who's going to talk about Ukraine because a lot of people don't care very much about the Ukraine thing. So Donald Trump would love to talk about like, you know, just get people lost in this in this mess. Yeah, I want to clarify on that. There are some people, you know, who criticize the left and say, how can you not care about um, someone committing impeach impeachable offenses? It's not about not caring that Trump has done that, right? But it's about understanding that people's personal lives and their kind of day-to-day you know, you know, concerns tends to crowd out what's happening on the yeah. MSNBC circuit. And if we're talking about put putting together a coalition that can beat Trump, it's going to be a broad-based working class coalition filled with people who aren't spending every day watching MSNBC and don't know the latest yeah. in the impeachment hearings. And if you want to mobilize voters, you have to speak to bread and butter issues. The incredible thing about Bernie right? And the thing that gives him a real gift as a politician. I mean, Bernie Sanders is one of the greatest communicators uh, that we have. Yes. And uh, you could see other candidates just, just lift Bernie's approach and his policies because they understand that Bernie breaks things down simply. He breaks things down in a way that, re that people can relate to. He says, let's take your life and the problems that you face in your life. Now, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do that is going to, I'm going to identify the source of the problems. I'm going to show you why they're happening. And I'm yeah. going to show you what we're going to do together yeah. to stop them. I, I mean, just I, like every time I meet people, they have problems where I go, oh, Bernie speaks to your problem. I, my Uber driver on the way over here was a, a guy from Honduras who's a citizen, mm -hmm. but his family is stuck because the Trump administration won't grant them a green card. And he also, he was like, Uber takes all my money. They take, you know, 40% and I can't make my rent. And I was like, like, if I tried to talk to him about like, well, what Trump said to the president of Ukraine about Joe Biden, how do you feel about that? He'd be like, I'm trying to get my family over here. Like all yeah. he thinks about is the fact that he hasn't seen his children in four months yeah. and he Skypes them every night and they and they say, when are we going to get to be with you? That's what he told me. Like, And Bernie goes, Bernie says to that guy, we need to get your kids over here. Yeah. What what matters in your life is your children and we have to get them here now. And you have to you have to help me. To, in order to make that happen. And that's so powerful because it's what people need to hear. Yeah, well, so the counterexample that people raise is this idea that, okay, but what about socialism? He's going to get on the stage and Trump is just going to hit him as a socialist. You know, I was on YouTube and every other commercial yeah. I get on that YouTube is a Trump commercial. And the one I got today was, let me know what you think about socialism. Text blah, 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 and, and tell the Trump campaign. Yeah. You know, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think that that using the S word, as it were, is going to be a liability? One thing that works really well about Bernie is that he leans into and embraces and doesn't hide things. And I think in the same way that Donald Trump, when people pointed at him and said, you're vulgar and crass, went, Damn right, I'm vulgar and crass. <laughs> like, that's why you should vote for me. Yeah. Bernie isn't ashamed of being a socialist. And mm -hmm. Bernie says, okay, you've heard the word socialism. Now let me tell you what it means to me. And I think, you know, I can't predict whether that's going to work. I mean, there is going to be, when Bernie gets the nomination, there is going to be a massive propaganda campaign yeah. to destroy him because he is such a threat to so many people's riches, right? That they are going to try, they're gonna come after him with everything they got and they're gonna say that word socialism over and over. What, it's one of the reasons that I wrote why you should be a socialist <laughs> because I want to preemptively say, when they say that to you, you need to remember that it is not true, that they are associating these, the, the word with ideas that we don't hold, and here's what it really means. And Bernie's really, really good at, uh, at doing that. So I wanted to do a rapid fire, because you do do this section at the end of the book, or you know, toward the end of the book, where you basically do a quick accounting of all of the kind of species attacks that 
are levied against oh, socialism yeah. and why everybody should ignore or why they're not true basically. Oh yeah. Um, and I want to I want to hit you with some of them. And we talked oh, about gosh, okay. um, we talked I about remember what I said. <laughs> uh, okay. So here here we are. Yes. Okay. I got it. I know. I can I can deal with this. Okay. So the first one is socialists dislike freedom. They only care about equality. Yeah, Just well, I mean, we've bit. kind of talked about this, right? Which is these differing conceptions of freedom where libertarian freedom is the freedom of your boss to fire you when you get pregnant. And socialist freedom is your freedom to spend time with your kids when you have them so you don't have to go back to work the day after giving birth. Yeah, it's just like negative freedom versus positive freedom, like framing up. So I had a, I had a, I had a law professor who used to open every class a uh, radical kind of leftist law professor used to open every class with commercials from the 90s um, that were all about choice and something being kept from you mm -hmm. and how you need to have a choice, whether it was Virginia Slims, it's your way, baby. Men have been telling yeah. you to smoke these thick cigarettes. Now you've got skinny, girly cigarettes for you. This is freedom. <laughs> or whether it's tricks are for kids. Ah, your mom and dad are coming for your tricks, cereal. We believe in your freedom like, to eat tricks. The cookie yes. crisp is like a literal burglar that's coming for your, like, your cookie crisp. And once you start seeing commercial <laughs> after commercial, you're like, oh my God, yeah. every single yeah. American commercial yeah. is manipulating this idea yeah. that someone's trying to take something from us and that yes. we need to rest it back and, in terms and the way to rest it back is by buying our product. Right. Glucose and <laughs> cigarettes yes. and all of these Smoke these things. cigarettes and you will be free. Right. And so I think that being able to talk about freedom from want yes. is an incredibly yes. powerful tool and something that I hear Bernie Sanders doing kind of uniquely in, in this field. So the second one is Venezuela, Venezuela, Venezuela. Well, that's all they say, basically, right? <laughs> I mean, no one who says that usually has like a sophisticated analysis of the Venezuelan economy. Um, they just go, Venezuela was socialism and look at look at all the people starving there. Now, the, the question that you pose in response is, what are the things that were done in Venezuela that you think that we're trying to do here in right. particular? Like we're trying to, you know, Medicare for all? Is that what you think is going to you get? The, in what? Tell me. Tell me the path between that and Venezuela. Um, now, of course, also the fundamental to democratic socialism is anti-authoritarianism. Right? We don't want power concentrated in uh, dictators. Right? And in fact, so when democratic socialists look at Bolivia, for example, which people don't like to talk about because it was so much more successful than Venezuela, even mm -hmm. under a socialist government, right? It saw you know, poverty went down, growth went up. Um, but of course, Evo Morales sort of concentrated power. And that, you know, if you're, a, if you're a sophisticated socialist, you say, well, I, I don't like that part of it. I like the part where you reduced poverty. I don't, I think, but I also think it should have been more participatory and you should have, like, not, it shouldn't have just been one guy. Right. And that's really important about Bernie, too, because, and it's one of the things that I think, I think makes him trustworthy, is that he says, it isn't about me. That's super, super important, is he says, it isn't about me. And this, this movement has to be larger than me. It has to involve the cultivation of young leaders who can take over. I am a vehicle for enacting your aspirations, but let's not have a personality cult. And I think we always need to be on guard against being too much about Bernie and not about the things that Bernie stands for. Right, that kind of partisan partisan first, um, you know, I, you know, I, Putting people on a pedestal stuff is has how we get um, Democrats not having a problem with the um, con consolidation of power under you know Barack Obama, and then continuing somehow mind-bogglingly not actually having a critique of Trump um, and his interventionism the same way um, th you know there's still people who are arguing you know increased voting for his military budgets um, having no problem with his foreign policy even right. as they kind of wring their hands about domestic affairs right so to have a consistent approach about that also I think in, in, gives Bernie trust in the eyes of a lot of Republicans to say, okay, I might not always agree with him, but he's been, he's consistently not wanting to aggregate power in the executive branch, yeah. whether it's a Republican or a Democrat in office. Well, I mean, yeah, this is very important. And, you know, foreign policy is one of the areas that Bernie really, really sticks out and that nobody ever talks about, you know, largely because the American media doesn't care about the lives of non-Americans. That's not an overstatement. I have data in the book about yeah. how little they care. You know, you can literally measure how much a death in one country counts against another death, yeah. right? People in this country don't pay attention to the victims of 
American military power. Bernie has been consistently anti-war, and that's incredibly important because non-American lives matter. And for an example of that, like Lyndon Johnson was a liberal. He gave us the Great Society, right? So he's a reformer. He gave us the, you know, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, he signed them into law, you know, but Lyndon Johnson was a monster because of the Vietnam War, because the Vietnam War killed millions of people. And so foreign policy is really important. If you just look at domestic policy and you don't think, well, what is this person's approach to the use of American power? Um, People die from that. Yeah. Um... It, you use the example of uh, kind of the pink washing of fighter jets at some point in this book, mm-hmm. um, and I think the example, you know, the conclusion of that is that you know you can you can paint a fighter jet pink and say it's for women's equality or breast cancer or whatever it is, but the the brown lives that are being killed mm-hmm. by the pilots of those planes matter as well, and it's it's difficult. There's a kind of there's a way that there's a emphasis on identity and identity politics, however you define it, and you talk about mm-hmm. in your book how it's kind of all over the place the way people define it. But there's a focus on identity politics without a focus on the intersectionality, which takes identity politics from being purely representational yeah. to being about relative power yes. um, and how we are able to equalize it, yes. right? Um, I-, I could go on and on. Yeah. I don't want to um, belabor yeah. uh, the point here in the book, but I do want to ask you, um, oh, that one's a good one. What's Socialists elevate the collective and forget the individual. Oh, this is really a, an one. interesting one because the idea that socialism is collectivist because we talk about society and Margaret Thatcher says there's no such thing as society. There are just individuals. Well, it's interesting because what actually happens is that people who talk about capitalism talk about the collective, the aggregate. They say, oh, look, on the aggregate, you know, uh, the, the statistics, the, you know, we, get, we got you know, more innovation or whatever. But you got to think like people don't live in the aggregate, and there are lots of people. Inequality means that this 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 arrow can conceal that for a group of people, it's going the other way, and yeah. that's you know life expectancy can be going up while life expectancy for poor people is going down. So what socialists do is we disaggregate and we look at individual people. And the other funny thing, of course, is that there is no more collectivist institution than a corporation. Mm-hmm. A corporation is a place designed single to serve the the single-minded interest of the uh, the serving of shareholder value, right? And Walmart is Maoism, right? You know, it's, 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 it'll kill people, but like, you've got to wear uniforms, well, you've got to devote like yourself to the good of the, yeah, well. Yeah, you know. um, yeah. but, uh, but that's the thing, right? You've got to think, if we really care about collectivism versus individualism, you've got to look at what people's lives are like. And there's no individualism in an Amazon fulfillment warehouse. None. There's literally like if you don't, you're turned into a piece of machinery. This is the socialist critique of capitalism, is that we don't think individuals should be pieces of machinery, where they can be discarded when they're no longer useful, um, where their value is in proportion to how much output they can put out. We care about people as human beings, and that has historically been the socialist critique. So if you don't like collectivism, you know, come and join the left. Yeah. You make a point at one point about uh, imagining a future and yes. how imagining utopias is an important part of this project because it helps people to understand what a world, a future world that we're aiming for um, could look like. And you reference Star Trek, which anybody who knows me or is listening to the podcast yes. knows is my absolute favorite. And a point <laughs> that I like to make about Star Trek is, you know, in a post-scarcity world, yeah. the kinds, you know, where it, you, write, you, write, you describe it as achievement matters more than the accumulation of wealth. The, the stars of Star Trek, their, their jobs outside of being a Star Trek captain are, I'm an archaeologist. Yeah. Or outside of being, you know, ben, Captain Benjamin Sisko, his dad has a Cajun restaurant in New Orleans, which I'm sure is very near and dear to your heart, given that's where you're based and where current affairs is based. And his son ends up being a writer, yeah. right? And so if we're talking about freedom and, and you know, what is more collective than being kind of a drone in a warehouse as compared yes. to being able to fulfill whatever personal intellectual um pursuits, including a lot that are of incredible value to the world, helping professions, teachers, things like that as well. Um, The last one I will ask you to do is people are inherently greedy or lazy. I love this one because it usually says more about the person making the criticism than about people. They're like, well, you know, all the people I'm around are like, but, you know, for the rest of us, 
we know that that's not true because we know people. We're neighborly people. We're friendly people. People. We just. This is not how human. If human beings were inherently greedy, if they operated according to a a sort of uh, pursuit of economic self-interest model of the human being, um, we would never have been able to build the great institutions that have made human civilization, to the extent that it's a good thing, uh, uh, possible. Um, people really aren't. What uh, you know. It's just it's just not true. You just go and you you around the world and you see if you if you actually look at people's lives there's this there's this big fear that like if we give people leisure time they're just going to lie in front of the television. Well they're not. If you give people a real alternative, it's not that people don't want to work. People don't like jobs generally, which are very different, <laughs> right? People like productive activity. Right. People like to be doing things cuz doing things is interesting. It's the structure of a job that is miserable. So when you see, you know, people that don't want don't want to work. It's not that they don't want to work. It's that they don't want a job. It's true. <laughs> when I, when I was at my law firm um, wasting time, it wasn't that I was just frittering my time away on the internet. I was Definitely writing current affairs uh, articles <laughs> at my desk. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I read a study once, um, it, or it, it was like a historical review that was talking about different attitudes toward various racial groups and the perception of them being lazy and how there was this remarkable pivot that would happen where all of the mythology about a group would be they were really hardworking. Yes. Africans are so industrious. Indians are so industrious yeah. as we're like colonizing, colonizing them. Oh, yeah, we got to recruit them to do all yeah. this stuff for us and work. And, and then, then the then second then. freedom becomes on the table, it's, oh, they're lazy and we have to keep them in captivity yeah. or keep them under the boot of colonialism because otherwise they left their own devices, they wouldn't do anything. Yeah. And how self-serving <laughs> these kinds of arguments and inconsistent they are. Immigrants are lazy. At the same time, they're so hardworking that they're going right. to take all of your jobs. Right. Right. I mean, this this kind of contradiction. Now, you can look, instead of just like creating a vision of what people are like, you can actually, there's data, people run experiments to see how ordinary people treat each other in situations, how they share out resources. It turns out people are sharers, they want to collaborate. Um, you have people who can't get along with others and who do pursue their self-interest, but those people are called libertarians and they're very rare <laughs> and they're a problem because <laughs> like, you can't have a good society when you have people who believe it's okay to just take as much for yourself as you possibly can, which billionaires do believe. Yeah. They do. I mean, you know, Leon Cooperman, this 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 guy who was criticizing the wealth tax as a billionaire, goes, you know, I, you know, I made my money, I built my millions, I, I my billions, and you know, no one could take it away. And, and you go, so you believe that you are entitled to just have as much as you like, and you don't have to you know, do anything. You're just, I mean, they talk about laziness. I mean, make a great point oh, about inherited wealth in the book as well. Inherited wealth and also capital income, mm -hmm. right? So passive income, which is a huge part of the economy, is money you earn in your sleep. And so when we talk about people not working for their money, you know, I, I give the example of like all the houses that Sean Hannity owns. They pay him rent every month. He's not like fixing up the houses, even though he's the landlord, right. he's the owner. If you just own stuff, your money makes the money. Your labor doesn't doesn't make the money. Your capital makes the money. Now, you, now there is there are defenses that are offered. They say, "Wow, well, they're putting their capital at risk." You go, that's a separate argument from the question: Is work what gives you the money? And it turns out that work is not at all what gives you the money because the people who work the hardest get the least. We know right. that. So okay. <laughs> I could sit here and like literally yes. chapter by chapter go through this entire book, but I will leave it to people to actually buy it and read it. And where can they find it? I think in bookstores everywhere. And I also did the audio book so they could listen to 12 hours Wonderful, of me because reading you have the, best the voice. entire, in my weird voice, they can listen to the whole <laughs> thing. Voice. Although it is a controversial voice. I don't know if you're, if you're very online watching this, there are deep, deep internet controversies about whether oh, Nathan Robinson me? is affecting his accent. Or oh, that, that controversy. Trip. Yeah, that's a real life controversy. Didn't you get your mom to call in and My say, mother. Can, if you ask my mother if you doubt me, because she will attest I was born in England, I came over to the United States, and I have a sort of weird hybrid accent. My parents are very, very British, and I was born there, and I have a passport to prove it. Um, this is a judgment-free zone. It's a safe space. But I will, I will ask you, you know, for people who say, okay, I don't identify as a socialist, I don't necessarily even think of myself as a capitalist, you know, what should I take away from this book? What yeah. what is what is the distinction that you're trying to make here or that you successfully make here yeah. between the world what world view is represented yes. by 
this book and the thinking that is that is in this book versus kind of the status quo thinking of how we perceive of ourselves, at least as a nation that is capitalist in nature? At the very least, it's focusing on the right things. One of the things that socialists have historically done so well is they have had sharp moral sensibilities. They have looked around at the world and they have seen the problems with it. And they have said, look, this is intolerable. You can't tolerate this. And this is why Bernie fits with the socialist tradition. Because, and, and, they, and in doing so, they have, they have challenged society to live up to very quite basic moral ideals. And I think it's easy to say, one of the frustrating things is you know, when I say things like, well, you know, here, here is a bunch of social injustices. People go, oh, yes, of course. Of course we care about those. And you go, yeah, but do they make you sick? Do they make you angry? Do you really feel like a, a boiling over rage when you, I, I get the Wall Street Journal and I, I read the, the Friday real estate section, which is called Mansion. And then, uh, and it's like 10,000 square foot houses. And they've got one, this is how to move your 10,000 square foot house when the, when the sea levels rise. Um, and, and it makes me so angry because I, I live in the French Quarter of New Orleans and there are homeless people lying in the doorways, who's sleeping in the doorways. Um, and you know what? And, and basic and the homeless people in in the French Quarter they sleep next to the piles of trash that are put out to, for pickup. And sometimes you can't tell the difference between who's people and who is a and what is a bag of garbage. Yeah. And like the idea of a society that has like how to move your ten thousand square foot house and also has that should be outrageous. When you see the the art exhibit, the banana taped to the wall that <laughs> someone paid $120,000 yeah. for, and you see people on GoFundMe yeah. trying to pay for their insulin for the next few months, that should make you angry. That should make you that's sick to your stomach. And what I like about Bernie is it does make him angry. And this is what distinguishes him from other candidates and what distinguishes him from liberalism. I'm critical of liberalism in the book. And one reason is because I think it sort of talks about injustice, but it doesn't feel that sense of urgency. And this is why Martin Luther King was so critical of liberals, because the liberals would all go, yes, 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 of course we share the goals of social justice, but you just need to take baby steps and we make society better slowly. And he was going, no, every moment that this persists, is an indefensible moment. And I love that Bernie does that. And I think that's what socialists have always done. That's what Eugene Debs did when he said, you know, when there is a lower class, I am in it. And it's what Bernie did when he sort of echoed that and said, you need to fight for people who don't, uh, where you don't necessarily share their problems. If they're an immigrant, you're not an immigrant, you still need to fight for them. Um, that is what socialists do. And it is very, very important. And I think it is the only thing that can really lead to social change because social change is difficult and you have to really be passionate about it in order to make it happen because there are plenty of interests in not having it happen. Plenty of people are going to try and stop you. So if you're going to make it succeed, you're going to have to fight. I, I sometimes feel like I used to feel like maybe it was Pollyannish. I think the society tries to make us feel like we're Pollyannas for saying simple statements like I – it makes me uncomfortable. It makes me angry to see homelessness and mm -hmm. broader injustices. And what I enjoy about um, the socialist movement, the Green New Deal, people like AOC and these um, young climate crusaders who have brought these conversations to the mainstream is that I feel like I have permission to feel as bad as I think we should all be yeah. feeling about it without feeling like I'm being somehow naive or childish. I do think people should go back to the questions that they had when they were children. Mm. This really is something important, which is simple questions that you never got satisfactory answers to. Mm. And if one of those questions is like, why does this person, you know, pose as an advocate of social justice in public, but then in private, they're really cruel to their subordinates. Like, you know that shouldn't be acceptable. You can, don't ration, don't rationalize things that you think are obvious injustices. This is really, really important because people will try and make you think think you're stupid. They will try to give you explanations that don't really seem to hold up. What I say is, you know, no, persist. You really have to. You, your judgment is good judgment, and it's right to be outraged. Well, thank you so much for coming here and sharing your outreach with us, Nathan J. Robinson. <laughs> um, and I hope you guys all enjoy this book as much as I did. That's it for this week. Let us know what you think at heartheburn at berniesanders.com or send us a tweet with the hashtag 
Hear the Burn. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to Bernie's channel on YouTube for more episodes of Hear the Burn, as well as all the other content that our team creates each and every day. Till next time.